The standard definition of the word science is described as the discipline of finding truths through experimentation and observation. This is typically done by forming a hypothesis, conducting said experiments to collect data that either supports or debunks your predictions, and finally documenting the results of the tests conducted to better understand how our world works. There are things, however, we can't see, or have not seen, and whether you are an atheist or a theist, these conclusions require a leap of faith. This has not stopped the atheistic community from loudly proclaiming their worldview as correct, and anyone who speaks to the contrary is ridiculed. That might sound a bit melodramatic, but this can be a common reaction if a person comes out and says they believe the world is 6,000 years old. One reason an atheist might be so bold is because of some of the results of radioactive dating. This method gives samples various supposed ages, with dates even including billions of years. This is often considered an open and shut case. But one must consider whether or not these tests are as accurate as many non-believers would like to assume. In this segment, we'll examine the differences between radiocarbon dating and radiometric dating. We'll then discuss a few critical reasons why these proposed methods are not the be-all and end-all in determining how old the world truly is. Finally, we will conclude this segment with some closing remarks. With the introduction now out of the way, let's proceed. First, let us define what are referred to as isotopes. These are two or more atoms that have the same number of protons and electrons, but not the same number of neutrons that are both contained within the same chemical element. These atoms are divided into two categories. Parent atoms, atoms that have not gone through radioactive decay, and daughter atoms, atoms that have entered into radioactive decay. As time goes on, more and more daughter atoms are gradually formed where less and less parent atoms exist. To use an analogy, imagine you have a bowl that you have filled up with green marbles. At some point, you have stopped putting in green marbles, and you then decided you would start taking away one green marble and replacing it with a red marble every minute until the bowl was full of red marbles. The bowl represents our sample. The green marbles would represent the parent atoms, the red marbles represent our daughter atoms, and the replacement from green marbles to red marbles represents radioactive decay. We'll come back to this analogy throughout this presentation. Now, Radiometric dating is calculated by examining a substance's radioactive decay and is used to determine the age of rocks, dirt, fossils, and so forth. Radiocarbon dating is used to measure the age of an organic specimen that was once alive. In attempting to prove evolution theory, this is used to prove the ages of creatures classified as dinosaurs or even prehistoric man. What is measured when conducting this experiment is the radioactive isotope called carbon-14. C-14 is produced when nitrogen within the atmosphere is hit with rays from the sun and is then dispersed throughout all living things. Once the creature dies, it stops receiving carbon-14, and as it deteriorates, the C-14 that was once received in the sample diminishes from the body and turns into nitrogen-14, 
with a half-life of 5,730 years. Supposedly, the age of the specimen is determined by how little C14 is found, which is done by calculating how many apparent half-lives the subject has gone through. So far we have learned that isotopes are atoms within a chemical element, either as a parent or daughter isotope, and gradually there will be less parent isotopes and more daughter isotopes. Radiocarbon dating tracks radioactive decay through depleted C14 levels in dead organic matter, and radiometric dating tracks the radioactive decay of non-organic matter, such as rocks, minerals, and other materials. As you can see, there is a difference between radiocarbon and radiometric dating. And by making this distinction, we can provide a more accurate answer when considering the following. If we observed a volcano spewing out lava, magma, steam, and gases, and the lava cools into rock, the age that we should be trying to find is when magma solidified by measuring the parent and daughter isotopes. The way these isotopes are typically measured is by the potassium-argon method, with potassium being the parent atom to argon's daughter atom. Surprisingly, however, we can look at volcanoes that have erupted within recent history, know the date of the eruption and when the substance had cooled, and find that the date proposed well surpasses the date of its formation. Take the example of Mount St. Helens, which erupted on May 18, 1980. In June of 1992, Dr. Stephen Austin went to the newly formed lava dome of the site and collected up to 15 pounds of magma rocks from the dome and after using the potassium-argon method, results were given claiming that this sample was up to 340,000 to 2.8 million years old. The reason why results like this are achieved is because when the volcano is erupting, the steam and gases that are being expelled contain argon. So when the lava had cooled, it trapped the argon from the gases inside of the rock, which didn't come from the radioactive decay of potassium. In other words, you started off with a bowl of green marbles and red marbles, making it look as though you had been transferring your marbles for some time. Meanwhile, both types were found at the beginning. In response to people who are not familiar with the study of radioactive dating methods, critics have stated that carbon dating is not used for fossils due to the absence of organic material within them. However, according to Scientific American, mounting evidence from dinosaur bones shows that, contrary to common belief, Organic materials can sometimes survive in fossils for millions of years. Even with the information out there about blood and other matter surviving fossilization, possibly suggesting that many of these fossils are not as old as some originally believed, like the purported millions of years stated in this article, Let's just remove fossils from the equation and just stick to organic matter such as flesh, bones, and dead things. If the half-life of C14 is 5,730 years, then the oldest possible age that we can attain from carbon dating is approximately 46,000 years old. This is not the millions if not billions of years that would be assumed by evolutionists. However, when considering what we have already learned about a sample being contaminated, it's still a shot in the dark to say one can actually find an object that is that age, 
let alone 6,000 years old, especially after we review these following examples. The unreliability of this method can be seen with examples where the date of the test subject's inception is known. Take, for instance, shells of living snails that were carbon dated to be 2,300 years old. Or, in another example, a freshly killed seal was carbon dated as having died 1,300 years ago. Remember, these are four of the items where the origin was known. And if this is producing results that are blatantly untrue, how do we know other tests being done are reliable? On a completely separate issue that has been brought to the attention of the scientific community, nuclear energy and weapons testings of the 20th century, along with carbon emissions pumped into the atmosphere, has admittedly made carbon dating obsolete for dating future subjects. In a quote from the Washington Post, physicist Heather D. Graven of Imperial College, London, found that carbon emissions from fossil fuels are artificially raising the carbon age of the atmosphere, making objects today seem older to a carbon dater. By 2050, new clothes could have the same radiocarbon date as something that's 10 centuries old. If environmental catastrophes of the recent past were able to disrupt C14 levels, what effects could older events cause? Even the 1908 asteroid explosion in Tunguska, Siberia was responsible for producing a C14 variable in our atmosphere that is observable in tree rings across the world. This was not a man-made disaster, which makes a person wonder what other natural catastrophes may have happened throughout history that could have also affected the atmosphere like a global flood, for instance. There are other issues that these dating methods have as a whole that makes it extremely difficult to produce an accurate date. Consider these following points. Point 1. The starting point of the sample's decay is unknown. You don't know how many isotopes were initially present when it started to decay. This would be as if you had a bowl full of green and red marbles, although nobody actually exchanged any marbles and this is what the bowl initially started with. You would have to make an assumption based on something you had not seen. Point 2. The rate of decay had not been traced throughout its cycle so you wouldn't have been able to say that the sample had been deteriorating at a constant rate. This would be as if you walked into the room where you found a bowl of mixed marbles. Perhaps someone was transferring the marbles before you came in, or perhaps the marbles were already like that. You wouldn't be able to know for sure. This would have to also be based on assumption. Point 3. Finally, it is undeterminable how much contamination the sample had been exposed to throughout its history, which causes negligence. If someone came along and threw in red or green marbles into the bowl, when you were either present or not present, you would have to say that the test was not reliable. You would have to once again assume that no contamination had actually happened, which may very well be impossible. As a closing summary of everything that we have learned throughout this presentation, radioactive dating attempts to use isotopes to find the ages of various samples. The less parent isotopes to daughter isotopes means an older sample. The radiometric method dates rocks and minerals, 
and the radiocarbon method dates things that were once alive. Radiometric fails when it looks at substances formed where both parent and daughter isotopes were present during the sample's formation. Carbon-14 produced within atmosphere changes based on both natural and unnatural factors, hindering carbon dating results. Finally, both dating methods require a series of assumptions in order to prove hypothesis is correct, with no real way of proving otherwise. Some professing Christians, being lazy or just not understanding what they are talking about, say that the Bible is not a book of science. This is something that is blatantly untrue, as Paul states in 1 Timothy 6 verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. The concept of evolution and the world being billions of years old is based on profane and vain babblings as it is primarily based on the philosophy that mankind is progressing. This also teaches that all morality is relative and that we can be as gods knowing good and evil. Colossians 2 verse 8 reads, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. God is not going to excuse the philosophies and vain deceit of man, in place of his truth. God created all things, and by him all things consist. You are a part of his creation, but you are also fallen and have entered out of his will. The only way that you can become one with the will of your Creator is by believing that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh and accepting the atonement that he made for your sins with his own blood. You could accept that, or you can imagine that you are to live the rest of your days on this earth as just another meaningless creature only to become a fossil that may or may not be dug up. Are you going to continue walking in the darkness of atheism, or are you going to enter into the light of the truth? The choice is yours.